So as Cindy said, the uh, last time I spoke here was 2004. Uh, I didn't wear glasses then, and I had a little more hair. Um, I think I've held up pretty well, though. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you my secret. I live across the street from world-famous aging researcher Dr. David Sinclair, uh, who, uh, so, who, who uh, selects some of his magic anti-aging potions to try on me. So if, <laughs> if <laughs> anyway, um, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you, Cindy, for, for inviting me back. Uh, I didn't realize that uh, when I spoke before, this conference was only two years old. Kevin Davies was there, uh, and many other old friends I'm sure I'll run into later on in the conference. So uh, it feels like coming home. So my topic today uh, is, what if you could create a new healthcare system? And what if you could start with a clean slate? Uh, we all wrestle with legacy systems and, uh, and data wrangling from those systems, and it's, it's really a hard job. But what if you didn't have to deal with that? What if you could also create this system in an environment that uh, served an aging population of health-conscious consumers uh, in a location that enjoyed strong government support uh, for preventive medicine, could be using from the start the latest technologies, including artificial intelligence and telemedicine, and operating in a continuous learning environment to enhance both research and patient care. And best of all, what if you could leverage a unique assemblage of resources that include human and financial capital, food chains, retail distribution, and telecommunications, and a large and motivated employee base? So what would you do? How would you do it? Where would you start? Well, a lot of people start in the U.S. because it's the biggest healthcare um, economy in the world. However, operating in the U.S. brings all of those legacy issues along with it. It's regulation, reimbursement, incumbents in the, in the, in the, in the field, uh, change management of physicians. You can go on and on and on about all of the different hurdles uh, to innovating in medical care and population health in a, in a country like the U.S. Uh, which also doesn't have a self-pay system <laughs> and uh, whose behavior is regulated by a number of different uh, private entities uh, that, that are, are uh, health insurers. So I'm going to take you to a different place where I think this could happen. Uh, come with me 11 time zones into the future uh, to Thailand. Uh, Thailand is a country of 68 million people. As you know, it's the uh, central country uh, in the Southeast Asian uh, Indo-Chinese Peninsula. But Thailand has a problem. The problem is that the Thai population is aging rapidly. This declining share of the working age population will adversely affect economic growth. By 2040, it's projected that 17 million Thais, more than a quarter of the population, will be 65 years of or, or older. And if you want to see where the U.S. is going to be in a few years, just, you know, you could look at Thailand and it'll be like looking in the mirror because we're going to have the same problem with our demographics. Together with Japan, uh, Thailand has the highest share of elderly people in any country in East Asia and the Pacific. The working age population is expected to shrink by 11% between now and 2040. How can you address this problem? Well, one way and a big part of the solution, I think, is to prevent disabling illnesses in the first place and to uh, adopt systems that keep people healthy and functioning longer. Now, the Thai government is uh, fully supportive of this. In fact, their new industrial policy is called Thailand 4.0 to provide increased prosperity, security, and sustainability uh, to the country. Uh, the first three generations of the Thai economy went from agriculture to light industry to heavy industry and automation. And uh, these have pretty much run, run their course. However, Thailand 4.0 um, is going to be based on creativity and innovation. Uh, creating a smart Thailand, smart homes, smart hospitals, smart transportation, uh, smart communications, uh, taking advantage of skipping the landline, skipping all that infrastructure that we still have to grapple with in, in, in our country and, and most uh, European countries have. They can skip all that and just go right to uh, a Thailand 4.0 um, technology base. So what are the elements necessary for measuring uh, and managing population health? Uh, the prior two days of the conference have all been about population health, and I'm sure uh, a lot of you have been thinking about this. Uh, in 2018, uh, in other words, uh, you know, in this era, it begins with genomics. 
Uh, back during the 1990s when we were doing the Genome Project, you know, we envisioned that every newborn, by the, t by the time, you know, the early 21st century came around, every newborn would have their genome sequenced at birth, and that would be a permanent part of their medical record that would guide their, um, their health, their health style and lifestyle and allow them to mitigate or prevent diseases throughout their life. That has not happened yet. Uh, it's, it's beginning to happen in, in some places, but we're nowhere close to what we imagined in the late 90s and early 2000s uh, where genomics would be. But we can, we can do something like that in a, in a different location. We can p perhaps do it in Thailand. However, there's a, in terms of genomic knowledge, there's been a persistent bias in the data collected by genome projects. In 2009, 96% of genomes that were known at the time were of European ancestry and less than 3% were, uh, came from Asia. By 2016, that had improved slightly uh, with only 80, 81% of the data from European populations. Most of the expansion in Asian genomes and, their, and our knowledge about them uh, comes from the Chinese. We know virtually, <clears throat> virtually nothing about the Thai genome, and I think that is going to be a rich source of, of discovery uh, if we can pull this off over the next few years. So we, uh, we're in, in alignment with Thailand 2.0. Uh, we're coming up um, uh, on the launch of a program called Health 4.0. And uh, what we're going to do is start collecting data from 350,000 employees and their dependents. Uh, their dependents and the employees who all work for a single company uh, create a, represent a population of about 3 million people. And I'm not going to tell you about the, the, the uh, company we're working with yet. I'll, I'll save that. Uh, I'll keep you in suspense until a little later in the talk. Uh, but we're going to be collecting genome information, not just human genome information, but microbiome and genome information as well, uh, because that's been increasingly recognized as an important contributor to health and uh, our response to drugs and uh, pro prognosis for a disease. We'll have access to family and medical history from those uh, subjects. We'll know a lot about their lifestyle and environments from existing public health surveys, but supplemented with real-time health monitoring uh, using wearable devices. So that's our, our idea about how to do a population study in a place where uh, not only we have the resources, but there's a, there's a nationwide will uh, to address this problem of the aging type population and workforce, and we're going to help solve it with Health 4.0. I'd like to switch now from population health uh, to uh, sickness and, and disease. Uh, precision medicine is talked about a lot, and what most people mean by it are targeted drugs and precision therapeutics. Uh, often ignored, however, is the real foundation of precision medicine, which is diagnostics. Uh, precision diagnostics is a necessary prerequisite. It's a necessary foundation uh, for better outcomes in healthcare. And in fact, 70% of critical medical decisions are based on clinical laboratory results. So if you want, want to start saving money in healthcare, you have to realize that since 70% of critical medical decisions are based on diagnostic data, the accuracy, reliability, and timeliness of that data affects all of the downstream spend in therapeutics and all of the patient outcomes. If they get the wrong diagnosis, they're going to get the wrong treatment. If it's too late, they, uh, it, it, it may be too late for them. And so it, it's often ignored how important diagnostic data is, and I'm going to tell you what our approach to that is as well. In fact, the National uh, uh, Academy of Medicine, formerly the Institute of Medicine, in, not, in 2015 published a, a study uh, which concluded that diagnostic errors represent a blind spot in the delivery of quality health care. And patient harm can result from a number of uh, possible errors. Uh, an inappropriate test can be ordered, and I'll talk a lot more about that in a few minutes. Uh, the appropriate test is not ordered. A test result may be wrong. A test result may not be interpreted correctly. Or a test result might be right. It could be interpreted correctly, but it could get there too late. Uh, this is called uh, diagnostic, manage, uh, diagnostic utilization, and uh, no one does it particularly well, even though so much of the downstream, uh, downstream of what happens to a patient is dependent upon it. So here's a diagnostic process. Um, 
that I'll just review for you. I mean, you've all been the subjects of this when you go into your doctor's office for your annual checkup. You know, they'll draw blood for cholesterol and, uh, you know, measure your complete blood count and maybe look at serum chemistries and things like that. Uh, so the, the diagnostic process start when the patient encounters um, uh, the uh, experiences the health problems and encounters the healthcare system. Uh, this very linear looking path here uh, involves what looks like it could be a virtuous cycle here uh, of doctors getting lab results back, interpreting them, uh, and then deciding on the best course of action uh, for the patient. However, this apparent virtuous cycle is often a vicious circle. And the reason for that is that people at the, the ordering doctors, the treating doctors at the left end of that diagram, uh, you may be seen by a variety of subspecialists who are ordering different tests at different times. Uh, they probably don't know what the other one's doing, so they're ordering redundant tests. They're both getting complete blood counts. And all of this data is just flowing in irregular spurts to the clinical laboratory who tosses it back over the wall uh, into, this, into this virtual cycle or virtuous cycle or vicious circle in order to synthesize the report and decide what's best to, to, to treat the patient based on the amalgamation uh, and interpretation of all this laboratory data. Another way I'll illustrate that is uh, through an example of conventional diagnostic testing. Now, uh, when I was in medical school, uh, part of the curriculum over four years, none of it involved uh, proper test ordering and utilization. We were never really informally, formally taught that. Uh, there was a survey done of US medical schools, uh, I think it was published in 2014, that on average, uh, a medical student gets about eight hours of formal instruction on the proper utilization of diagnostic tests. Uh, they don't learn how to order them uh, until they actually graduate from medical school or interns, and they just do what the older physicians tell them to do. Uh, and again, uh, they didn't get the instruction either, and so you lead to redundant testing, you lead to it leads to inappropriate testing, uh, and this can result in real patient harm, as I've already described. So what you have basically are the treating physicians sort of throwing test orders over the wall. The lab data is just throwing isolated bits of laboratory data back over that wall. And it's supposed to be assembled by, ordering, by the ordering physician who is, as I said, minimally trained in test selection and interpretation. So one way to get around this is instead of throwing data over the wall to treating physicians, you can operate under uh, some, a concept called the diagnostic management team. Uh, this concept, and I'll describe it in more detail in a minute, was pioneered over 20 years ago at Massachusetts General Hospital, but it never caught on. And it never caught on because the treating physician said that we don't want the lab docs telling us what to do. We know how to interpret these results. We don't want you, we, we don't want you telling us how to, how to treat our patients. But as you can imagine, with the, on, you know, the implementation of genomics in medicine, most of the t treating docs were never taught genomics. They don't know anything about it. And they, uh, and they don't have time to learn or the necessary vehicles to learn it. So diagnostic testing is becoming increasingly complex and, and you know, beyond the capabilities of, of most treating physicians to, to understand and interpret these tests correctly. So um, a diagnostic management team consists of a multidisciplinary group of diagnostic specialists and uh, who look at all the data and then put together a consensus uh, interpretation and plan uh, which uh, in, a, in a timely fashion is passed back to the clinical care team who don't have to try and figure out all these tests that are irregularly being thrown back across that diagnostic wall, some of which they don't even feel comfortable interpreting. Uh, and then the last uh, thing a diagnostic management team does, now at this point, all of the data is existing not in the EHR, but in the laboratory information management systems. And I think that has really big implications for uh, the future work of anyone who's interested in, in uh, data mining and, uh, and data, uh, data analysis, uh, because a lot of the data that, that uh, we, we all hear about the EHR, uh, we all hear about radiology, uh, but we don't really think about what's in those laboratory information management systems, and, and that's where most of the diagnostic puzzle um, pieces are, are found. So a diagnostic management team approach uh, allows care, treating physicians to spend more time caring for their patients and not figuring out diagnostic puzzles. Uh, the diagnostic physicians are not lobbying isolated laboratory or data tests all over the wall, but instead creating a more meaningful and timely uh, report uh, that's specific to a particular patient. 
And what that really accomplishes is turning the wall into a bridge uh, and solving a diagnostic puzzle. Now, what is the nature of diagnostic data? I want to talk about that because, again, uh, it's rarely discussed. So uh, I have an example from one of our, our neighbors here, Partners Healthcare. Um, it took them about two years, but when they uh, decided to change over to a new electronic health record system, uh, they had to convert five years of worth of patient data from their old EHR to the Epic EHR. It, it took them about two years to do this. The second largest data conversion uh, in that conversion to Epic was radiology with 14 million reports. So that kind of begs the question was, if that's, radiology is the second, what's the first? Well, the first, the first is laboratory data, which represented five, not 14 million, but 500 million reports. And these are all these isolated diagnostic puzzle pieces that are sitting in uh, laboratory information management systems and get um, transferred into the EHR in a, in a in irregular, sometimes in an irregular and incomplete fashion. It turns out that when you look at statistics like this, laboratory test results constitute 70 to 80 percent of data in the electronic health record systems. And with the advent of new technologies, pathology data volumes are poised to increase radically with the adoption of digital pathology and whole slide imaging, which I'll describe shortly. This is a good transition to this section of my talk, digital health data and machine learning. And this also goes back to my original title, Skipping the Landline. Uh, so how many people have been in their grandparents' house recently and they still have a rotary phone? Uh, uh, who still has a landline? I do, and the reason I do, it came bundled with my cable TV and internet, right? That's the main reason I have one. But, you know, what's happened in the last 30 years has been extremely dramatic. Uh, we've gone from uh, uh, immobile analog device to basically a uh, tiny computer connected to the internet. And I don't have to tell this, this group how, what, what profound changes that's had on our society, our economies, you know, new business models, new, new ideas. Um, many of, uh, of the applications of this new technology are good, some, some are not, um, but it's transformed the world. So let's look at the diagnostic uh, analogy of that. So, um, does anyone know what, um, when the microscope was first introduced into routine clinical diagnostic use? I mean, it's been around since Van Leeuwenhoek, you know, in the 14th century, but when, it was, when was it first used to routinely diagnose cancer? In the 1850s. And uh, we're, in fact, we're still using the same dyes, hem hematoxylin and eosin, the red and pink, uh, the pink and blue stuff. Um, so basically, when you get a cancer diagnosis or any kind of diagnosis that involves a tissue specimen, your, uh, your diagnosis is being made using 19th century technology. Does anyone know when the, uh, when the FDA was founded? 1906. So the use of the microscope predated uh, the FDA by 50 years. And in fact, uh, the FDA, uh, because the microscope was around so long, uh, it was never cleared by the FDA through a 510K process as a, as a diagnostic <laughs> instrument. So when you get a tissue biopsy today, your specimen is being analyzed using 19th century technology that's never been cleared for patient safety and efficacy by the Food and Drug Administration. So can't we do better than that? So on the right-hand side there, the, and the kind of the equivalent of the cell phone and mobile communications is a digital pathology platform. I'm gonna spend the next few minutes talking about that. Uh, there was a landmark approval, really a clearance, uh, by the FDA uh, just about a year ago in 2017. Uh, the digital pathology systems have been around for uh, more than a decade, but they were not high quality enough to re replace that 19th century instrument. <laughs> Uh, now they are. Uh, before uh, the FDA approved uh, the first digital pathology system, uh, they were being used to create research archives of uh, FFPE specimens. Do you all know what FFP is? Formulant fixed paraffin embedded tissue. So as, as you may or may not know, when a biopsy or a surgical specimen comes, comes out of you or, or any other patient, 
uh, is examined by a pathologist in the laboratory. They slice it into little pieces. They put it in a little plastic cassette uh, where it gets fixed and then embedded in wax or paraffin. And then the next day it goes to the histo histology lab and is sliced up into very thin sections which are laid out on a piece of glass and stained with those 19th century dyes. Uh, and then that case is delivered to a pathologist to look at with that 19th century instrument. But so this, this could change everything. Now to give you an idea of how much it could change, um, uh, so this is a field called digital pathology now. And I'll just sort of um, describe uh, the impact it could possibly have. Uh, this uh, picture here represents telemedicine. And let me tell you why that's important, maybe uh, more to the rest of the world than to us. Uh, I have uh, two stories to tell you. Uh, there are so few pathologists in India that if a patient has a specimen or a biopsy taken out, they can get it turned into microscope slides locally, but they often have to fly to the nearest city where there's a pathologist uh, qualified uh, to look at that. Literally, they have to pick up a box of glass slides, fly to some other city, and put it under a pathologist's microscope. In China, it's some ways even worse. Um, they have so few pathologists there that cancer patients, um, based on a radiologic diagnosis alone, are often operated on for their cancers without any tissue diagnosis at all. So this obviously creates a huge opportunity for telemedicine and digital pathology, but the key is, is being able to digitize those images. Let me show you what that looks like in practice. Uh, this is the uh, Ohio State University James Cancer Center. Uh, it's one of a number of NCI-funded cancer centers uh, in the United States. And it's the first hospital system in the world uh, that I know of that has committed to going completely digital. They haven't thrown all their microscopes away yet, but they're being phased out. So let's look at some of the data they've generated in less than a year. So in just eight months, uh, they've generated uh, 500,000, uh, in, in processing, digitizing 500,000 pathology slides, uh, they created 1.2 petabytes of data. Now, how many, how many of you remember how many NCI cancer centers are there in the US? 70, okay. So do a mental calculation with me. If every NCI cancer center in the US converted to digitizing their pathology and diagnostic operations, how much data a year would that amount to? Yeah, 70, 100 petabytes. Now, what if I told you that those 70 NCI cancer centers only care for 15% of cancer patients in the US? It's a little harder mental calculation, but how much data does that add up to? It's almost an exabyte of data a year. Uh, now, what's the equivalent of, of having all that in a database? Well, do you see these little uh, cardboard carriers here? They actually hold the glass slides that are usually delivered to the pathologist sitting in their office with that 19th century microscope. I mean, they have modern ones. Of course, technology's improved, but it's a 19th century technology. And what they do is they pick up those, those individual slides with their fingers, put them under the microscope, and then they will dictate their interpretation uh, into the medical record. Uh, there'll be no uh, record kept at all of what the actual image looked like on the slide. After a year, these, sl these slides go from a local archive to sit in a warehouse somewhere. And if you wanted to look at a case that was 10 years old, it would probably take you three weeks to retrieve those slides from a warehouse somewhere, come back and have, a, have someone look at them. At Ohio State, they're not doing that anymore. Uh, they're not delivering these uh, glass slides to the pathologist. They're delivering them uh, to a scanning center uh, where they're scanned. And what the pathologist sees in their cockpit is a list of cases they have to evaluate that day and how many slides per case they are. And if they ever have to go back to it, it's just a database retrieval operation, not sending a courier down to a warehouse to pull glass slides out of, uh, out of a warehouse. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of where most hospitals are today. And I'll just, I'll just challenge you, do you, you know, if, uh, if you wanted, uh, if you had a serious illness today, uh, you know, uh, how would you want your tissue analyzed? How, how would you want it interpreted? Now, at the same time, pathologists are still looking at each and individual slide, but think of the enormous potential for research uh, and training machine learning algorithms on uh, almost an exabyte of data 
uh, from uh, if we digitize all of all of pathologic diagnosis. Uh, this is going to catch on slowly in the company in, in this country for two reasons: is that they have to recapitalize when they throw their microscopes away; they have to buy scanners, um, and unfortunately, laboratory uh, clinical laboratories are considered cost centers and not profit centers, so they're at the bottom of the budget. Uh, but another problem, and it's equally problematic, is change management. How do you get pathologists who sort of are conservative by nature to actually give up their microscope? I think you know a lot of them are going to have a chain to their wrist because they don't want to relinquish that for more uh, for more advanced technologies. Uh, but they'll they'll eventually have to. So our concept uh, for an integrated precision diagnostics platform of the of the future. Uh, really is a, a synthesis of the three, uh, three important diagnostic modalities um, in, uh, in medicine today. If you look at radiology, when was radiology first, when were x-ray images first used for medical diagnosis? It was in 1895, another, you know, 19th century technology. Pathology, I said, uh, these H&E sections, these purple and pink sections go back to the 1850s. Genomics is, uh, is, the, uh, is the new cousin, <laughs> uh, dating from routine clinical use, you know, barely a decade ago. How on earth do you sort of uh, manage the change of combining these into an integrated diagnostics uh, system uh, that can interpret extremely difficult and ever increasingly sophisticated molecular testing and uh, creating a, a diagnostic report that incorporates both the imaging the tissue specimen, uh, the pathologic diagnosis, and the molecular diagnosis. So we're, we're going to do this, and we're going to do it first in, in, uh, in Thailand. So where do we go from here? Uh, today, I would like to announce, uh, this is the first public uh, announcement of a, <coughs> a new, a new um, entity in Thailand called CP Medical Center. Uh, the chief medical officer, uh, Rujapang Sukabodi, uh, is sitting there in the front row, and I'd like you to stand up. And... Okay. <laughs> so, so now, <laughs> so now you're wondering who's who's who is CP? Okay, I've given you enough time to kind of Google on your phones and look them up. <laughs> uh, but uh, they are actually the largest company in Thailand. Uh, they are a, a multi-business uh, conglomerate um, that has 350,000 employees uh, in 16 different companies. Uh, their three core businesses uh, are agribusiness and food, retail distribution, and telecommunications. And as you can see, CP provides this unique assemblage of resources that we are going to bring to bear on this problem uh, aligned with the government industrial policy of, of Thailand 4.0. I actually encountered CP in an unusual place after I, I got to know them and visited Thailand a couple of times. I was in Costco, and uh, uh, I think they per CP Corporation produces something like 40% of the human protein for human consumption in the world. And next time you're in Costco, look at the frozen, like heat and eat, you know, Asian meals. If you flip it over, you're likely to see that logo on the bottom. Okay, so CP is actually gonna be a physical hospital and medical center. Planning for this started several years ago. Uh, ground will be broken uh, on the actual new medical center, which will combine both clinical care and research in this continuously learning environment. However, uh, we're not gonna, you know, sit on our hands until the building's ready. Over the next couple of years, um, uh, we're going to be doing a series of pilot projects, and uh, I'll describe those for you in a minute. So CP uh, Medical Center is, is, um, is, exists in a larger uh, framework, a vision that goes out to 2035, in which CP Medical Center uh, will be embedded in, in, a sm in, in smart Thailand uh, with access to uh, consumer uh, retail telecommunications and, uh, and the entire sort of uh, chain from, from diet to, uh, to illness uh, that it affects. So these are the pilot projects we're, we're going to be taking on in the next year or so. Health 4.0 I already described with genomics, environment, and lifestyle data. Uh, we are going to um, put the first 
integrated precision diagnostic center of excellent in the world uh, in, in, at, at CP Medical Center. And we will also be building a prototype of a digital health data system that's designed from the scratch for machine learning. So with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, some colleagues. I already had, uh, we call him Dr. Joe, I already had him stand up. Uh, but Ed Shulak is here, Jason Anderson, David Sinclair, Carlos uh, Bustamani, and Jose are, are also here. Could you please stand up and... So with that, I'll end there and uh, take, take questions, be happy to take questions. Thank you.